In Africa today, a plane carrying the presidents of two African nations has apparently been shot down as it was coming in for a landing in the capital of Rwanda. UN officials say that both presidents were killed there, the leader of Rwanda. April 7th, 1994. The tiny Central African country of Rwanda appeared today to have descended into chaos. At this early stage, in early, the first week of April, we, you know, I and I don't think anybody had any idea where this was heading. We knew it was going to be bloody and messy, but we didn't think it was anything systematic. Uh, none of us had any uh, idea of the, the, the depths that the horror would come to. The best estimate uh, now looking back is about 800,000 people were killed in 100 days of, of, of chaos, of violence there. Um, uh, that's 56,000 people being killed every week. Or if you break it down even further, that's 8,000 people a day being killed. Or 333 people being killed every hour for 100 days, for 100 days. That almost screams out to you that the entire population was involved, as it was. Neighbors were killing neighbors. Uh, Hutu and Tutsi, who had lived peacefully next to each other, suddenly became enemies, and the Hutu would go over and just slaughter the Tutsi neighbor. Uh, they were able to kill 800,000 people it, with very low-tech means. I'm talking machetes, I'm talking with knives, I'm talking with gardening tools. It was just basically a low-tech genocide. May 7. The massacres that have claimed up to 200,000 lives in Rwanda did not begin as a spontaneous outpouring of tribal rage, but rather as a systematic campaign of killing directed by political leaders and backed by the military. Now, the Clinton administration later said that they had no idea of the scale of the violence or what was going on. Uh, I refer them to that story, telling them that at that point, this is pretty early on, already 200,000 people had been killed in a campaign of violence orchestrated by the government and the military, and by this radio station that was on the air, the Radio Mil Colleen, which was exhorting people to go out and, and kill their neighbors. <laughs> June 10th, the commander of the small United Nations detachment in Rwanda conceded today that his efforts to broker a ceasefire in the civil war there have shown no signs of success. He predicted more fighting and more massacres. This was the Canadian general, Romeo Dallaire, who, who it was deeply affected by his inability to stop this crisis going on and the inability of the UN to organize to do anything to help beef up his force or the inability or, or unwillingness of any other large actor like the United States, the Brits, the French to do it, to send in any troops to help out. We have every reason to believe that acts of genocide have occurred. How many acts of genocide does it take to make genocide? There was I think just a collective willingness back in the United States and in all the world capitals to put your heads in the sand. I mean, this was only six months after we had lost um, a, a huge number of army rangers uh, in, during the Black Hawk Down incident in Somalia. And I think there was no appetite in Washington at that time uh, to engage ourselves in another African tribal war. July 30th, Goma, Zaire. The cholera epidemic that has ravaged the Rwandan refugee population and produced piles of rotting corpses along roads in Zaire has finally shown signs of ebbing. But relief workers here are bracing for the possible onslaught of another disease that could claim even more lives, dysentery. This was the end of July. By this time, uh, the war uh, was winding down and a lot of attention had turned to what to do about this massive refugee population of Hutus, among whom many, well, many of them were the killers or the political leaders who had orchestrated this campaign of violence. I must say that a lot of people uh, were looking at this just horrific scene of, of death and misery going on in these refugee camps and thinking it was almost some type of uh, retribution for what had gone on inside of Rwanda at the time. We keep telling ourselves that never again are we going to let a, a, this kind of a holocaust happen. We said that after World War II, we said that after the Khmer Rouge genocide in Cambodia. We said it after, belatedly after Rwanda, but then we see it again in Darfur. And right now we're looking at what's happening in Syria. When there's something like a civil war, a man-made incident like this, I think there's really a reluctance to get involved and maybe even a willingness to put our heads back in the sand the same way we did uh, with Rwanda. And it's going to be something that we end up regretting.